Okay, we're good to go. So this is um, uh, Philip Paps, who's, who's a FreeBSD developer who's going to be talking about the KFreeBSD uh, point of KFreeBSD port in Debian from the FreeBSD point of view. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so in case you were wondering, I didn't submit to the wrong conference. Uh, I'm, I'm aware that this is a Debian conference. But uh, you may not be aware that um, Debian is actually a FreeBSD distribution. So uh, this talk is uh, the talk we actually usually give to uh, large companies who build products based on FreeBSD and who want to be more involved in the FreeBSD community. And I felt that given that Debian is also a large company or organization, if you prefer, who are uh, including FreeBSD in their products or their distribution, <laughs> it would be a good idea to give you guys this talk and let you know how the FreeBSD project works. And also there's, yeah, there's a number of reasons I would like to give this talk. So uh, KFreeBSD allegedly is part of the next uh, Debian, uh, Debian release. Uh, you guys take a different approach to the whole uh, distributing FreeBSD than everyone else does. You, you use your own user space for reasons which are no doubt very interesting. Uh, and I think KFreeBSD does actually have great potential for reasons I'll expand on later on. But uh, there is one thing uh, that I have noticed, so this little slide of statistics. Uh, we have develop developer summits uh, as the FreeBSD project at our conferences every now and again. And the number of Debian developers at this uh, last summit, and the one before, and, and every dev summit, as a matter of fact, has always been a very round number. And if you, if you compare this to the number of you know, Juniper employees who show up at dev summits, which is not a very round number, just a very large number, it's, it's a bit distressing, especially since uh, comparatively speaking, Juniper's use of FreeBSD is much simpler than what Debian is doing. Uh, also, the number of commits to the FreeBSD head tree. Oh, question. Okay. They've just been hiding then, maybe. The, the comment was that there have been some FreeBSD, uh, some Debian developers at a Dev Summit. Oh. Okay, for the second point, number of commits to add. I, okay, there have been some patches submitted by Debian that have been um, merged into Ed. Yeah. Not a lot, I agree, but there have been some of them. Well, I just, uh, because Subversion is not exactly the most search searchable revision control system, I just did 2010 a quick grip for obtained from Debian, and that returned a very round number. So I'm, I'm sure in the past there must have been some because, well, it's working, so you can't possibly have, have it working without some kernel support. Microphone, microphone. I also can tell you that sometimes there is uh, fixes in software that benefit free FBC, free F, F, B, D, B, S, D, and that go directly to upstream, for example, in KDE. Yeah, no doubt there is some, some Debian code in there, but it's, it's just not very visible. Uh, but the next statistic is definitely a real zero. Uh, I don't think there are any Debian developers with FreeBSD commit bits. And if you're going to be a distribution or yeah, a credible distribution, I think someone should probably get involved with uh, FreeBSD enough. I'll get into that later in this talk. And just, well, I don't, I don't think there are any FreeBSD developers who are also Debian developers, but I, I don't think that's a relevant statistic. Uh, so this talk is how the FreeBSD project works. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about what FreeBSD <coughs> is, what you get with it, and how we do third-party applications. And then I'll contrast this with uh, what Debian K FreeBSD is doing and how I think it's better or not so better in different places. And then I'll talk a bit about how the FreeBSD project works, which uh, you can then contrast with how Debian works uh, as an organization, as a bunch of people working together on the same operating system. And this should maybe inspire one or more of you who's also working on KFreeBSD to maybe join the FreeBSD project and uh, you know, help out from that end. Uh, so FreeBSD is an open source BSD Unix derived operating system. We are uh, not just a kernel, unlike Linux. We are a complete operating system. We have our user space, libraries, all sorts of tools. Uh, everything just fits together. You can build it all with one command. 
Uh, FreeBSD is very popular in the ISP network space. There's a number of really large ISPs who have uh, thousands or tens of thousands of machines running FreeBSD, and they are very happy with this. Some examples are listed there. Yahoo is obviously the big one. Uh, New York Internet, they're just around the corner, well, corner-ish, somewhere. Uh, more recently, FreeBSD has also been gaining some visibility in the embedded app uh, application space, embedded in the sense that the operating system comes with a device, not necessarily that the device will fit in your pocket. The devices these people make tend to be on the order of fitting in a small-sized apartment building rather than in, an, in a regular-sized pocket. And also, FreeBSD has been used by a couple of companies to build their operating system. They, these people usually take parts of FreeBSD. Uh, in the case of Juniper, they take the whole thing, but they, they diverge in the network stack. Mac OS X, they've got their Mach kernel and they stick the FreeBSD user space around it, which is, I think, exactly the opposite of what WNK FreeBSD is doing. You're taking the kernel and sticking your user space around it. So that's interesting. Uh, FreeBSD is arguably one of the most successful open source projects. Obviously, it depends on how you want to define success in the open source world. Uh, I think that having you know, tens of thousands of deployed machines is a pretty good measure of success. Uh, Debian is also a highly successful open source project. But you can't use the internet without using FreeBSD. The focus of the FreeBSD project uh, is storage, networking, and security, um, not to the exclusion of any one of those. And there's a phone ringing, and it's not mine. So the FreeBSD kernel, which you are borrowing, uh, is a multi-processing, multi-threaded kernel, uh, which means it's finely grained. It will run happily on as many CPUs as you care to throw at it, within reason but we are getting better like that. We support many popular architectures. I think Debian is only uh, currently interested in i386 and AMD64. I don't know if anyone's done any work on any of the other architectures. Uh, FreeBSD is particularly gaining traction on, uh, on MIPS. Um, there's also quite a lot of work going on on ARM, but uh, MIPS is, is very big these days because the, the big MIPSs are very popular in the embedded space. Uh, like Linux and every other operating system in the world, we have Unix and POSIX interfaces. Obviously, we have BSD interfaces because BSD is, well, what we are. Uh, our network stack is uh, the reference network stack for at least IPv4 and, uh, and probably IPv6 as well. Uh, we have other obscure things in our network stack too, like Apple Talk. Uh, I don't know if anyone still uses that, but we have it. Uh, more recently, the FreeBSD network stack has been the reference implementation of SCTP, which is uh, probably not something people are using at home, but if you're a large tel telco, you're probably using SCTP somewhere. Uh, and our 802.11 network stack, wireless network stack, is also used by people like, uh, I think Apple is using it and Solaris are using it, so it's a very portable sort of network stack. Uh, our kernel is uh, a unified kernel, you, there's no bits and pieces which can go wrong. It's all maintained in the same tree. You can build it all with one, uh, with one command. And we have extensive kernel documentation. Linux is getting better like that, but uh, we do have very extensive kernel documentation. Uh, as I said, FreeBSD is not just a kernel. We also have a user space, uh, which is completely integrated, uh, as in completely uh, the opposite of what the GNU thing is doing, where there's hundreds of teams working on each, in the, each application separately. The FreeBSD project maintain, maintains all of these things um, in an integrated sort of way. So all the, uh, all the tools you'd expect on a FreeBSD system are there uh, by default. If you type make worlds, you will get them all. Uh, and we have build time options which can disable many tools for the smaller embedded spaces. And we think it's interesting that the kernel and user space are maintained by the same people so that if something changes in the kernel, user space can follow. We have a strong policy of, uh, we call it POLA, the path of least astonishment. Uh, if something changes, or if there's two ways to make a change, we go for the one that will astonish the least number of users. If you can break a user space kernel space interface, or you can just pad a structure at the end, we go for the gentle thing. Again, our user space is also extensively documented. Um, this is where you guys are diverging. You, for whatever reason, are not choosing to use our user space, so you don't get this. But our user space is there for, uh, for you to use if you want it. I'll get back to that later, uh, later on. We are modularizing 
lots of parts of FreeBSD serve. There are some tools which you want to provi provide the user an option. Sorry, yeah, microphone, microphone. So, yeah, but if you want to give the user an option, you know, GNU grep or BSD grep, you can do that. I think uh, BSD tar is already in Debian, and I use it to great satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that brings me to a question, I guess, of if, but it's really of the audience. Is there someone here who is really active in Debian GNU K free BSD? Yeah. Cool. Cool, cool. So there, there are. Yeah. Uh, the installs? No, I'm, that's cool. I've, uh, to be honest, I've not tried it myself. I, I run a company with uh, Wouter, who's in the back of the room, and the last time he tried to install Debian K FreeBSD in a jail, he panicked the machine, and since then he has not had root access. He has not had root access on that machine since. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, <laughs> so uh, mixed success. But well, it's in the uh, it's it's in the official Debian distribution, so I assume it's a, it's a credible port, and I'll you know I uh, I'll get get into that later. But I think Debian K FreeBSD is, uh, has a number of really interesting applications, and I would like it to succeed as much as, well, presumably you guys do. So, uh, and that brings me actually neatly to this uh, set of slides here uh, on features we've got in user space under kernel, and that's jails and virtualization. Uh, the last couple of years, the FreeBSD project has done an in immense amount of work on virtualizing. Uh, FreeBSD in a way that other operating systems don't necessarily do it. Uh, there's a couple of popular ways of doing virtualization. Either you take the whole machine and you pretend to be a CPU and you, under the carpet, do things to make this fast. And then the other way is the, the way which um, Solaris has done with containers and, and little boxes and you, you try to keep your applications in there. Uh, FreeBSD has done a little, uh, yeah, a little different sort of approach. We've got uh, jails, which are a shroot with network connectivity, and as I'll uh, talk about later, and these days an, uh, an entire network stack to underneath the jail. So uh, you can give uh, random users uh, root access in a jail, though not on the base machine, because then they will panic your machine if they try to install Debian. But uh, this, <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm mean, I know. Um, but uh, this makes it really easy for uh, web hosting companies, for instance, who want to give you know, random users for a certain amount of money a month or a year or whatever. You know, this is your little virtual machine. You can be a root here. You can install whatever secure or unsecure applications you like. And no other customers are going to be affected by this. And uh, this is actually one of the places where uh, jails are seeing a lot of use. And this is somewhere where Debian K FreeBSD could come in really handily because Debian is a great, uh, a great desktop operating system to the continued amusement of that. I do run Debian on my laptop. And it's, I think it's a great desktop operating system because package management, you know, we, we have package management on FreeBSD as well, but it's not quite so easy to deal with uh, individual binary packages or to deal with packages on a machine that changes every now and again, or if you want to follow certain packages, it's difficult, it's not impossible, it's just difficult to do with the FreeBSD package managing system, and apt and dpackage or the combination of the two actually makes that really nice on Debian. So if you can stick uh, a Debian K FreeBSD in a jail on FreeBSD and then just, well, and, and give a random user, here's your root password and just deal with it, and you can use um, the package managing tools you're used to on your desktop, provided you use Debian on your laptop. We assume that everyone does. Uh, you can use the same tools on your server, and it'll be a familiar environment. The only difference is that you have the power of FreeBSD underneath, uh, as in, well, not that the Linux kernel is bad in any way, but our virtual network stacks are something that makes hosting companies really happy. Uh, we started working on this, well, the first prototype was uh, a long time ago, but we started really working on this in uh, the FreeBSD 8 and 9 release cycles. 9 is still, is well, still working, but the vImage work allows you to plug a whole network stack underneath the jail, uh, as in layer 2 and layer 3, everything above that. You can assign multiple IP addresses to jails. You can run a firewall per jail if you like. Um, so pretty much there's no real difference between... Uh, running on a naked machine and running inside a host from the user perspective or even from root's perspective. The only, yeah, the only way you'll be able to see that you're in a jail rather than in a real machine is you'll have a couple of syscitals that look different 
and uh, yeah, you'll have one disk instead of maybe 100 disks underneath. Um, this is yeah, this is a key feature, and if we could get Debian K3BSD running well in jails, I don't know, does it actually work now, uh, installing in jails? You guys should know. Sorry? <laughs> microphone, microphone. So, yes, we are able to run jails on the GNUK FreeBSD, but we are not able to run uh, a GNUK FreeBSD, Debian GNUK FreeBSD jail inside a plain FreeBSD. There are still some problems to solve there with the kernel. Okay. But. Are those that, that's a goal. But all those problems are no, or the problems are known and, and being worked on, so it's, it's not that no, It's not, I would say, they are known, but it's not the top priority right now. Okay, because from the FreeBSD perspective, that would be something to work on, and if, uh, if FreeBSD can help you out there, then uh, I'm sure someone will be happy to, maybe not necessarily me, but someone <laughs> <laughs> can probably volunteer. But yeah, so the combination of, of a virtual environment uh, with a user space which is familiar to many people because it's what they use on their on their home machine, then that would be uh, that would be a great market. I could name a couple of hosting companies who are very interested in that in that sort of environment because uh, I do have to admit that package management in uh, in FreeBSD is is not for the faint of hearts. But uh, yeah. Uh, FreeBSD, in addition to our wonderful jails and virtual network stacks, we have documentation for everything, which um, may not be relevant for K3BSD because your user space is so vastly different from ours. But I just wanted to point out we have man pages, we have release notes, and, and everything else, and books. People like reading books. Uh, our third party applications, I'll, I'll talk about briefly because it's, it's uh, Debian K3BSD doesn't use them. We have something called the ports collection. Uh, it's a source-based package management framework rather than a binary sort of uh, thing Debian does. Uh, this means that you basically uh, have to compile your packages. We do have binary packages, but if you want to diverge in any way from uh, what's, what's provided, you just need to compile them. And you find that pretty much everyone compiles. Either you have one central machine building packages for a thousand others, or you just have the machines run some scripts to uh, update your packages that way. Uh, we've got 18,000 of those. I don't know how many packages are in Debian these days, but it's probably an order of magnitude more. Uh, we don't tag our packages to releases, which I think is different from what Debian does. We, uh, we have one port tree, which, just, uh, which is always heads, and it always builds usable packages or allegedly usable packages, depending on if the package itself is useful in the first place, on uh, the current supported uh, release branches. Uh, our FreeBSD ports collection does make it really easy to maintain local packages. That's also possible with Debian, but it's not easy, I think, maybe, you know. Uh, we have a Linux binary, binary compatibility layer. I don't know if K3BSD wants to use this, but it's, uh, it's not an emulator. We do system call uh, wrapping, so system calls have numbers on Unix, and we just look system call 4 on FreeBSD is read, on Linux that's something else, and the implementation is slightly different, so we just map them to, to stubs, and that's blazingly fast. And it actually makes most uh, Linux binaries run reasonably well, provided that they don't have any sort of funny dependencies. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's a, um, a translation layer, so obviously it runs behind Linux, and it's often not the favorite thing for people to work on. So it was recently updated to work with uh, Linux 2.6, which has been out for a little while. Um, <laughs> uh, most Unix and Linux applications will just work on FreeBSD, either uh, through the ports tree or just sticking binaries on there. But uh, yeah, you're obviously replacing that with your own. Um, more interestingly is what the FreeBSD project is and why I invite you to join it. Uh, the FreeBSD project is much like the Debian project, an online development community. Uh, unlike the Debian project, we have central source repositories and revision controls, and not just a central package uh, repository or package database or whatever it is you call it. We have rather fewer developers than uh, Debian, I think about a third. Uh, last time we counted, we had 364 uh, CVS committers, where we currently call them um, subversion committers in the source case and CVS committers in ports. And we have thousands of contributors. I have a little graph later on. 
Uh, we have lots of mailing lists and much the same, uh, much the same thing as Debian. Uh, our license is different from Debian, while Debian does the free software with a capital F thing, uh, which I won't talk much about. We do the Berkeley license thing, which basically means we write the software, we enjoyed writing the software. If you enjoy using the software, you should do so in whichever way gives you the most pleasure. If that means you know, selling it or using it in binary, that's fine. We don't care. As long as you don't say you wrote it, we're happy. Uh, so by all means, go wild and use it. Uh, we also have a foundation. I think Debian has a similar sort of construction. Ours is a non-profit organization, and it takes money for FreeBSD and gives it to FreeBSD. It also tries to provide some legal shelter for tricky things, like we do contracted development for some of our uh, corporate users. The organization also sponsors travel grants to our conferences and buys hardware, lots and lots of hardware, and negotiates agreements, but that's not very interesting. Uh, the FreeBSD project produces a number of things. We produce uh, the kernel, we produce our user space, we, well, we produce a security officer, he's been produced a couple of years ago, uh, presumably by, by his parents, uh, similarly with the release engineering team. Uh, we also produce the ports collection and binary packages. We make releases every now and again. It would be nice if, you know, if we could somehow synchronize releases in, in some way, but down that road may lie ma ma madness. We produce books, handbooks, web pages, and marketing, and we do technical support on mailing lists. We also do flame wars if Hannah is still here. Uh, and we also organize uh, conferences. Of course, we don't produce without actually consuming. We uh, consume the same thing as, uh, as Debian developers. Uh, beer, soda, vice of choice here. Uh, we love hardware. Uh, I don't know. I think the Debian project, I saw something on the DebConf channel about machine naming. Someone was complaining about, I can't ever remember these machine names. We have the same problem. Uh, we love hardware, especially if it comes in big racks with hands to press the big red button when they fail. Uh, we consume bandwidth in faster than old quantities. It's, uh, it's, it's impressive how much bandwidth uh, we use. Uh, we like to travel to conferences. Uh, we like to you know, eat every now and again, so salaries come in handy, or contracts for those of us who are contractors. And like everyone else, we thrive on thanks and good press. Oh, and more bandwidth and more beer. Um, we have processes uh, which uh, uh, surround our people, much like the Debian project, but our processes are maybe a bit different from the Debian pro uh, process. We have a concept called a committer, which is someone who can type uh, CVSCI or SVNCI and it will work rather than complain. In Debian, you have De Debian developers who upload, I'm told. I'm not entirely sure about the Debian proceedings. We have a core team who sits at the top of a tree and uh, does many unspeakable things. I'll talk about them a bit later. We have two classes of committers, but they're, well, they're not you know, class A and class B or in any way subservient to each other. We have the ports committers and the maintainers who live in the ports tree, and then we have the source team who works on the kernel and user space. We have various groups and projects, um, all sorts of other things, but I really don't have time to talk about all of them, so I won't. Uh, so how does this all work? It works differently from Debian. Uh, I mentioned that uh, committers are people with subversion or uh, CVS rights. We select our uh, committers a bit. Uh, I think Debian also has a pretty tough selection process, but the FreeBSD process is not casting concrete. We basically look for technical expertise on the area of code uh, the committer is working on or the proposed committer is going to be working on. Uh, there should be a history of contribution to the FreeBSD project, as in we don't give commit bits to people who say, yeah, I write some C and I would like a FreeBSD commit bit. We don't do that. And we like our committers to work well with the community to avoid flame wars. And generally, com uh, proposed committers should make these characteristics obvious, and then we punish them with commit bits. So generally, committers are invited rather than uh, proposing themselves. Uh, a key concept in the FreeBSD project is the concept of a mentor. Uh, every proposed committer is proposed to the core team or the port manager team by someone who volunteers to mentor them. And basically that means for the first couple of months or weeks or whatever uh, of the proposed new developer uh, working on a FreeBSD project, the mentor will read through their patches and, uh, and generally you know, collect pointy hats on their behalf if they do something wrong. Uh, our committers, yeah, we have rather fewer of them than Debian. Uh, they're, last time I counted, in 34 countries on six continents, which I think is all of them except for Antarctica. 
Uh, our oldest documented committer was born in 1948, which is a very long time ago. Our youngest documented, documented committer was born in 1989, which makes me feel old. And this, uh, the interesting thing is that our mean age is rather old, uh, well, old-ish, uh, compared to some open source projects. Uh, FreeBSD developers tend to be professional programmers. Uh, we have some hobbyists, lots of consultants, uh, a couple of university professors in the most diverse fields you could imagine, and some students as well. We do the Google Summer of Code thing as well, and we've got a number of really interesting committers from that. Uh, this is a nice little map. It's out of date, the usual clusters uh, of where people are, a heat charts, which is similar. Uh, age distribution is fun to look at. Uh, I, yeah, I'm somewhere in the big bunch. Ha -ha. <laughs> uh, our committers, I mentioned, we have a number of types. We have got ports and source trees, and we've also got documentation. And it's about uh, equal, th well, not quite equal thirds. It's unequal thirds uh, distributed. But uh, many source, uh, source committers also have ports commit bit. Many ports committers also have source commit bit. And just about everyone commits to doc every now and again uh, when something gets changed. Uh, yeah, this is just some more blown out. I don't have time. Uh, so the FreeBSD project is uh, divided up in a number of groups. We've got, uh, we can roughly divide them up into developer groups and administrative groups. Uh, source developers, core team, core team secretaries, lots and lots of them. And I think this is probably the same situation as in the Debian project. Everyone is part of a team or many teams and everyone is generally overworked. Uh, we have many more teams. Uh, so in addition to this list, we still have this list. Um, there's nothing very exciting on here, um, I think. Uh, we have, nah, no, nothing exciting on there. Uh, we have a core team, which is different from Debian. Debian has uh, a fearless leader at the top who is elected every now and again via a process which sparks lots of mailing list discussions. Uh, the FreeBSD core team is a rather quieter body. It used to be uh, key developers who got shouted at a lot and shouted at other people a lot. But uh, it became a democratically elected body in 2000, and we've recently had our latest core team elections actually in June, and there were no flame wars. Well, not many flame wars. Uh, the core team consists of nine people because one, one person uh, couldn't possibly handle the flood of email. Uh, there's a core team secretary, that's me. I get to read the email, but I don't get to vote, and I don't have to take responsibility for anything other than writing monthly reports. Uh, the core team has a couple of administrative responsibilities. We approve of new commit bits, and we uh, bless hats. We say, you know, you, ha you can have roots on this machine. Uh, the core team deals with that. Uh, the core team also has a strategic role. We guide roughly where the FreeBSD project should be going, and we brought people into action like that. Sometimes the FreeBSD core team secretary gets sent to a conference uh, about the Debian project to talk about, you know, there's this Debian K FreeBSD thing, and maybe you should brought them into action, so that's what I'm doing now. And the main thing the core team does is uh, basically resolving conflicts. Uh, if you put uh, 50 cats into a room, you're going to have 50 cats fighting in a room. Uh, most FreeBSD developers are fiercely independent people who have to cooperate on code and have to display common sense, and they have vastly different opinions on each of those um, subjects. So sometimes, obviously, this explodes and you get a flame war. Uh, the FreeBSD core team tries to mediate these flame wars in a gentle, sort of uh, quiet way to, to avoid flame wars, actually. Um, as I said, yeah, we have uh, many, many uh, Ports committers, but we have even more maintainers. I think in Debian this is slightly different, but I don't know how exactly it works. We have 160 ports committers, and maintainers just maintain the ports. It's a, it's a line in the, in the make file, and a couple of committers pick up on them and CVS commit them. Uh, so that's how we work. You work differently. Uh, an org chart is different, difficult to draw for this sort of uh, uh, strange, spidery organization. We've got the core team and the foundation at the top or the bottom, depending how you look at these things. Uh, we bless a bunch of teams who do various things at the top. Uh, they, the security officer blesses the security team. The release engineering deals with admins. And at the baseline of this chart, we've got the people doing the actual work, which are the committers and the uh, ports committers, source committers, doc committers. So I think this looks roughly like what Debian looks like, too. 
just the labels are different. Uh, we have lots of mailing lists, uh, each with their own special variety of flame war. Uh, I'd actually be interested to see a comparative analysis with the FreeBSD mailing lists and the Debian mailing lists just for fun. Uh, most of our mailing lists are public. Uh, some of them are private. Security of officer is obviously private because, you know, uh, if you type this command, the FreeBSD kernel will blow up remotely. We would like to, you know, announce this in a somewhat responsible way to the world. Uh, we have machines everywhere. Uh, I think I mentioned machines. We like machines, especially if they come with hands. Uh, we've got two clusters sitting on the left side of the US uh, on top of an inconvenient fault. So not mentioned on this uh, picture is that recently we've got uh, a data center being worked out on this side of the, the US where there is no inconvenient fault. Uh, we've also got a cluster in Denmark and we've got some stuff in, in the Netherlands too uh, underwater. Uh, so we've got machines everywhere. I think this is similar to the Debian project. Uh, a key thing in the FreeBSD development model, uh, moving right on, I think there was an outline slide missing there somewhere, somewhere but that happens. Uh, FreeBSD does the branched uh, development model. We have a current branch, which is uh, the head of the development tree, and that's always the same. You would call this SID or unstable or unhappy or, or maybe even experimental. I don't know what, uh, what you'd call it. Uh, of that, we branch uh, a stable or uh, supposedly stable branch at regular points. These days, we, we try to do them every 18 to 24 months. We try to say, right, uh, let's branch heads into something stable. And then we further stabilize these branches into something which is really stable. And then we call them releases, and we release them onto the unsuspecting public. Uh, I don't know where KFreeBSD would want to be. L last I've seen is that your uh, kernel is based on FreeBSD 7.2. Is it on 8.1 now? Okay, and whatever I was reading is out of date. So you're obviously tracking release branches rather than stable or definitely not tracking head, which is probably the, the best idea. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. How often do you want to update FreeBSD? Do you want to stick with? Yeah, it mainly depends also on the... Um, way uh, Debian evolves, we have to stick with the uh, stable release from Debian, yeah. so it's chosen each time, there is no real rule. So for Debian. instance, say next Debian would be released with 8.1, then you would be on 8.1 for that whole release of Debian, for, for or the would release, you go to 8? For the stable release of Debian, and probably you are going to switch to a newer kernel for squeeze plus one. Yeah. And do you maintain the lower version number? As in, do you want 8.1 to stay the same for squeeze, or will you go for 8.2 at some point, or 8.3 if that ever happens? We are probably going to backport a few things, but stick to 8.1. Okay, yeah, because that, that's, well, that's, that's one incompatibility with, with Debian and FreeBSD, is that Debian has this strict policy of whatever's in, sta in stable or release, or whatever you call it, stays the same. And uh, in, if you're going to stick with 8.1, you're going to lose out on a lot of fun things in, in 8.2. So allegedly, nothing really major happens on, on stable branches, but things do happen. More questions? Whoa. Uh, since we're talking about that, uh, how long uh, are the release cycles in, in that in terms of uh, end of life? So ah. if Debian has a release cycle of X many years, what's the release cycle of those FreeBSD kernels, and are we going to be running into a problem where we're going to be stuck on a kernel that's no longer supported in FreeBSD? That's, yeah, that's exactly my worry. We have uh, two sets of uh, end of life cycles. We've got the standard sets, uh, which I could look up, but I don't remember, which is reasonably short, and then we've got the long-term uh, long support or longer supported branches, and I think they're two years or something after the last release of the stable branch which is maybe a bit short for a Debian release cycle, but I know that saying that I will probably have a herd of mad Debian developers shouting at me. So, uh, yeah, so really if you're going with 8.1 for the lifetime of a Debian release, that may be, well, I'm not going to say unwise, but that may be challenging uh, if you are going to say, you know, take 8 for the release and stick with 8 because uh, these stable branches are not supposed, to, uh, not supposed to break in any way. We don't break the kernel interface. We don't break the binary interface. We just uh, add bug fixes 
and uh, sometimes we merge features back. But, uh, yeah. That's not that different than what we do in stable, I mean, in terms of bug fixes. But it, are these branches, these are branches for the kernel and the user space, Yes, right? we have our whole operating system. So how much does the kernel change in, over the course of one of those stable branches? That depends. It, it really depends. Uh, sometimes uh, not very much, and sometimes uh, a feature which has been gently simmering in heads gets merged into a stable branch at some point between, say, 8.1 and 8.2. Uh, a driver which was uh, in head for a good while but not deemed ready for 8.1 will suddenly appear somewhere between 8.1 and 8.2 and then will be part of the 8.2 release. In terms of big architectural changes, generally, no. So if, if, uh, if a subsystem has been cooking in heads and it didn't make it for 8 release, it's not going to make it for 8.1 or 8.2 either except when it does, but it, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it usually doesn't happen. So if you, if you take 8.1, you have the benefit of you know, no surprises ever. Uh, the only thing that's ever going to be committed to 8.1 are security fixes, and for the kernel, there are usually not very many security fixes, but I don't have statistics uh, about you know, kernel and user space uh, security fixes with me. Uh, if you're going to stick with the 8 release sets, that may be much more flexible for, yeah, for people who need support for a longer term, both from FreeBSD and Debian. That's, obvi that's obviously something that, that's going to pop up once uh, KFreeBSD really exists, is you have two sets of people uh, giving security advisories. You've got the Debian project uh, giving security advisories for things in, in, in user space and in application space, and then the FreeBSD project uh, issues, issues uh, security advisories on the kernel. So presumably Debian will take the FreeBSD ones if and when they are re relevant, but it's, it's something we also need to think about, or someone needs to think about. Uh, yeah, this is more about our development model. It's not very interesting, especially given the amount of time I've got left and the fact that the video team allegedly likes to take breaks. Um, yeah, one thing I would like to also mention is we have Perforce uh, as an additional version control system. Our main tree lives in CVS and in, in Subversion, but we use Perforce, which is an evil proprietary system, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but it also happens to work really, really well. Uh, for branch development, uh, for things which are not quite ready to go into heads. Uh, if you've got things uh, for Debian K FreeBSD, uh, where you want to fiddle with the kernel in, in, in very interesting ways, which would make your life interesting, I'm sure you can easily get a Perforce account if you choose to use it to uh, make your work visible that way and to, to poke around and follow uh, and track FreeBSD development actively. So uh, I'm sure people would love to, uh, to help you out with that. A number of big FreeBSD projects were born in, uh, in Perforce. I'm not saying Debian K FreeBSD is supposed to be a big FreeBSD project, but if you want to make it a big project, then hey, go wild. Uh, our um, symmetric multiprocessing project started in Perforce. Our MIP sport started in Perforce. We put our Summer of Code students in Perforce, and they seem to be doing well there. They thrive. Sometimes they get commit bits, and they move into subversion. Uh, this is just a pretty picture which I thought I'd include of how branch development works. Now there's a Git, which is a credible sort of open source um, thing which does the same. So maybe more people will be using Git. Uh, an important thing I would like to mention is the FreeBSD project also organizes conferences. They are rather shorter than DebConf. Uh, two weeks is a very long time to hold a conference, or one week and a week of uh, DebCamp is a very long time. Uh, FreeBSD conferences tend to be two days long. It's usually a weekend, Saturday and Sunday, and we have developer summits one or two days before the conference, so Thursday and Friday, or when, whenever the conference takes place. Uh, usually about 100-ish people show up to the dev summits. Uh, there are venues for working on ongoing projects. It's uh, amazing how much work can get done, as you've probably noticed the same, when you stick people in the same room without sharp edges and some beer and somehow code materializes. It would be great if some uh, Debian developers would show up to our FreeBSD dev summits so we can talk to them about uh, things they're working on and work with them on uh, making FreeBSD easier to distribute as part of Debian. Uh, obviously, where possible, we, we, uh, we do like our user space as well, but if we can make it easier for other people to wrap their user spaces around Debian, then uh, we obviously encourage this. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to wrap up on time, actually. Uh, so why should you care about this presentation at all? Uh, I've given a talk, this, this talk, uh, usually we give to companies distributing FreeBSD. Uh, deal with it, you are now a company distributing FreeBSD. 
Uh, you borrow FreeBSD in a very complicated way, in fact, in a much more complicated way than many, uh, many other consumers of FreeBSD. The, the usual case is uh, either an application or part of the FreeBSD kernel gets borrowed, usually in the network stack, and that goes off to live a life on its own, and then it gets merged every now and again. Debian is actually just taking our kernel as a whole and plugging it into a completely different operating system, which is uh, a, a new and novel thing for, for both of us, I think. And it, it's, it's interesting because we like, well, we, the BSD license says it all. We like writing software, and we love for it to be used everywhere. So if this gives you pleasure, then it gives us pleasure to give you the software. Uh, it's a great potential for success, as I mentioned. Hosting companies would really like uh, jails with Debian K free BSD. So users have their uh, familiar environment for installing packages and doing whatever it is they do in user space. And I think that if this is going to work well, we should probably work together. Uh, that probably means that uh, maybe uh, some Debian developer should show up to Dev Summit. Uh, you're more than welcome. Just uh, look at the wiki and just sign up as a guest and get someone to, uh, to invite you. That's not very difficult. Uh, more and more bits of FreeBSD are being modularized. TAR was the example I gave earlier. Uh, some bits of the GNU user space are um, interesting. And the BSD versions are less interesting. So maybe you can give users a choice of using the, the, the BSD bits rather than the, uh, the GNU bits where possible or, or whatever you like. But um, the modulari modularization effort should also make the uh, K3BSD effort easier. Uh, we're not saying that we're going to make the kernel a package. I, I, uh, that flame war comes up every now and again, and it, it, it never ends well. Uh, but if we can make the life of distributions easier, we uh, definitely want to do that. And I think if we can talk together about this, we can do a lot of fun things together. And that about wraps it up. That was a three-hour talk, which I've compressed in 45 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> I will happily take any more questions, uh, if there are any Questions. Can, uh, grab the mic. Hold down the button. Oh, it's on. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I was involved in FreeBSD before uh, Debian a long time ago, and I've been working on the um, uh, installer rewrite that tried to happen a long time ago. That was called libh. Um, it, it's happening again, I think. <laughs> that, that's marvelous, and the best luck to those people. Um, <laughs> but I, one of the problems I stumbled upon back then, and which may explain why uh, Debian is not packaging userland, is that well, userland is this world's big chunk of stuff that's not com um, uh, easily isolated in separate packages. And it, as far as I remember, it doesn't register itself in a package nope. registry when it's installed. Nope. So I guess I have two questions. That's the first question is, is there, um, is there an objective in the long term of merging the ports collection package registry with the userland package registry so that there's a single package system um, or find a solution to that problem in general. And the second one is uh, I know that the Linux compatibility layer or was is or was based on Red Hat and is there a plan to use well Debian shims instead? The first question is the easiest. The answer is no. Uh, our ports tree is uh, a, tr uh, a tree. Uh, the formal definition is it's a tree of third-party applications, as in uh, applications which the FreeBSD project does not produce. There are some applications in the ports tree which are FreeBSD applications, but they're usually compatibility things for older releases. But the ports tree is really for third-party applications, and the source tree is what we make. That's our operating system, and it's a, uh, we want the source tree to be a complete operating system. And where you draw the line for complete and not complete is uh, ob obviously subject to interpretation. We still have send mail and binds in the source tree. A number of people are of the opinion that that's not part of an operating system and feel that the operating, stops at, operating system stops at Lipsy. Uh, we, yeah, we dance around that line a bit. But there's definitely no plan or no effort that I'm aware of. And I, I, if, it's, if it's out there somewhere hidden, if it's hidden, it's definitely not going to work. But if it's out there somewhere, I don't think it can work. There's, there, there's no plan to package user space. And I, then I was mostly referring uh, to the duality between tools like FreeBSD update and like port install or whatever. Yeah. Well, like, FreeBSD update is in the base system. Uh, it's somewhere in user has been, I think. 
uh, but ports, ports update lives in, in the ports tree, that's true. Uh, and port update is a bit of a funny one, but it's the main reason it lives in the ports tree, I think, is because it's written in not C. Uh, there's a number of applications. Uh, the FreePC project has a history of writing very useful tools in not C. Uh, CVSUP was uh, a popular one for a while. It was written in Modular 3 uh, for reasons which only John Polstra knows. And it was recently rewritten in C, and CSUP now lives in, uh, in the base system. Uh, the question is, you know, how long will CSUP be relevant now that we've moved to subversion rather than, to, uh, than sticking with CVS? But yeah, so the general split is that third-party applications live in the ports tree, and source is our operating system. And I've forgotten your second question. Uh, Linux Red Hat. Linux Red Hat. I think it doesn't really matter what you're using for Linux Compat because the, uh, the, kernel, the compatibility layer is in the kernel, so it doesn't care what the distribution is because we, uh, we uh, are compatible with the Linux kernel, not with some distribution of it. Uh, I think there are a number of, uh, number of distributions, and I think I may have them on my laptop, but I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I know we definitely have Red Hat and Fedora uh, user spaces in the ports tree. I think we also have a Debian, or had or have a Debian in the ports tree as well. Had, okay, Wouter says had, uh, and wants the microphone to expand on this. So it used to be the case that um, the default was actually Debian, um, but that was only up to uh, Potato. Because after Potato, we switched away from uh, having a base target GZ, and then uh, installing our base system was required having the bootstrap, which you didn't have in the port tree. So ah. it was actually stopped supporting, and we don't. Yeah. It's not there one, anymore. One challenge of the Linux compat layer is that obviously Linux applications don't just depend on system calls; they like libraries too. Uh, and while FreeBSD libc is is a a complete C library implementation. It does vary in a number of places from GNU libc. Uh, and we have in the ports tree a number of reasonably complete Linux distributions, which we uh, unpack in user compat or, or somewhere similar. And then we stick the Linux applications, or people stick their Linux applications under the same tree. And then you shroot in there, and it pretends to be a Linux system, and, and the user is none the wiser. Or you jail in there, and the user is definitely none the wiser. Uh, but I think the reason Red Hat and Fedora were chosen is because we have uh, unpackagers, uh, RPM or, uh, or RPM to Scipio or some, something like that, which makes it easy to unpack Red Hat packages. And while Debian packages are obviously just R files, uh, there is a little more subtlety there <laughs> to, uh, to just unpack them. And you know, if someone feels a great need to uh, package Debian for FreeBSD, I obviously encourage this effort. It, uh, well, Walter can do that in his copious free time. <laughs> so, Any more questions? Yeah. More questions? I have a question. Um, well, it's more of a question for the audience. So is, can anybody here comment on the state of the K-free BSD distribution? Is it, is, it, is it workable as it is? Can I install it on my laptop? Will it give me everything that I'm used to having? I'm not sure my answer will be very objective given <laughs> I am working on the port, but uh, I will say that uh, on the server point of view, it works very well. You can reuse the server. On the desktop point of view, there is still some work to do. That's uh, where well we are lacking. It's, uh, I, I think, uh, to be honest, I think the main market for Debian K3 BSD is probably going to be on the market, as I mentioned uh, a couple of times. People with uh, huge machines running FreeBSD already, or people with hundreds of machines already running FreeBSD with jails on top of that, would love to be able to stick Debian in some of those jails, or you know have a have a Debian FreeBSD machine as well. That, uh, but yeah, it would obviously be nice if the desktop worked too, so I could run it on my yeah. laptop and get rid of the perpetual scorn from Wouter that I am running Debian on my laptop. I I certainly <laughs> think it's useful to have it. I mean, we we had this discussion during the herd. Dis distribution talk this morning that ah. it's useful. To, it's very. I think it's very useful and healthy to have these alternatives. I think it can make both of us uh, better, right? The Debian yeah. Debian could be a more uh, well. You know, the, the very crude way of describing Debian is uh, duct tape and spit to make GNU useful. Uh, so if you can make it even more useful by uh, replacing the kernel underneath, then that's great for you guys and for us. Obviously, it's great that our kernel works with more than one user space. 
That's not that there's anything wrong with our user space, of course, but we understand the sensitivities of many people. Um, <laughs> and so, um, so I have another question. Anybody else have any more questions? Yeah, five more minutes. Um, just real quick, the, the jail thing you're talking about, that's like a built-in virtualization thing yes. in, in the FreeBSD kernel? Yes. Okay. It's, it's basically, it's shoot on steroids is how it started. So you can just do, uh, yeah, you just do change root, uh, but in addition to just having your file system rooted under a different directory, you also have a network stack plugged into that. And up to FreeBSD 8, the network stack is basically an IP address. And since FreeBSD 8.1, I think it's multiple IP addresses, or it might have been slightly before that, uh, and even IPv6 addresses. So you can, yeah, you can stick one application in a jail, but a, a much more popular uh, approach is that you stick uh, a, j uh, a naked machine with nothing in it, and you stick a jail on top of that, uh, which is a complete operating system in itself. You just pop the whole user space in there and stick your users in there, and then your staging environment or another user is another jail, and then if you upgrade, you just build a new jail and you move the data over, or you keep the data in the same place. And it, it just makes life very simple. It's, it's file system virtualization and network virtualization. And in FreeBSD 9, we're going to see the network stack virtualization even uh, more drawn through, up to the point of having uh, an entire network stack per jail. Uh, you can have a routing table or multiple routing tables in a jail. You can have a firewall in a jail. You can do uh, Sounds anything. very cool. One more question? Uh, uh, yeah, that's what it yeah. sounds like, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, there are some differences, but yeah. yeah. Uh, th this is not so much of a question as it is an opinion. Uh, I was thinking that really, to me, one of the great advantages of KFreeBSD on Debian is uh, with our enterprise track today, um, Puppet. You know, you, you can uh, deploy these you know configuration management systems now to free to a FreeBSD kernel, which may have certain features such as ZFS, uh, some of the great yeah. networking features that it has, and you can do that without having to worry about you know a whole new configuration thing, say with uh, you know Puppet or um, you know it's just provides that compatibility layer in, in an enterprise. You really don't want to be messing around with too many user spaces, even if you do have to compromise on the kernel. Well, oh, I shouldn't say compromise, well, but you yeah. know what I mean. There, there, there are a number of features in the FreeBSD kernel which are not in the Linux kernel for various reasons which may or may not be technical. Um, I've mentioned the virtual network stacks, and vServer is there, and it, it, it legitimately works, but jails is, is different. Um, jails are a very popular reason for people to choose FreeBSD. ZFS is another, another very popular reason for people to choose FreeBSD. It's, uh, it, it's very compelling for people who have vast amounts of storage needs and, and buildings full of storage to be able to manage that in a sane way. And between you know, Solaris and FreeBSD, a number of people are choosing FreeBSD for many reasons. But uh, yeah. All right, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.